the silver lining of the situation at the moment is we get to suddenly be everywhere that we would normally never manage to reach. We've, we've become less remote as everyone else has become more remote. Um, so Mark and I are going to share the presentation tonight. Uh, we're going to start off with a um, fairly swift gallop through um, the archaeology of Shetland and the sea up until um, the sort of Norse period uh, with me. And then uh, Mark's going to take over and talk about the development of Shetland boats and then moving on to the, the traditional boat cult culture up here. And then at the end, so we're going to go roughly chronologically. And then at the end, we're going to return back with me to the work we've been doing with the archaeology of the small, the more recent, the post-medieval small boat, um, with our work in Moda Um, So, Mark, if you can give me the first slide, we'll go right, right back to the beginning. Um, and we're gonna um, oh, sorry, one 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 slide, I forgot I had this slide in. Just to um just to remind you, Shetland chronology is slightly different to everywhere else because we we um, we don't get any Romans, we don't get any Anglo-Saxons. Now, some of you guys will be kind of the same in that. But um, so we go from around 6,000 years ago, the first people came to Shetland that we're aware of. And then we kind of gallop through um, until being Norse until 1472, when we become part of Scotland. So the 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 archaeology, the early archaeology of Shetland um, is slightly different chronologically um, to elsewhere on the mainland. So yeah, Mark, next slide, please. I always feel slightly like I'm on sort of countdown or something when I start this next slide, please, thing. Um, so going right back to the start, um, the earliest identified Shet site on Shetland um, was West Bow, which has been carbon dated to about um, 4000 BC. So it's the Mesolithic Neolithic transition. And this is the first evidence we've got of people arriving in Shetland, obviously arriving by boat, um, presumably arriving by, um, sorry, my computer bonging at me, um, presumably arriving um, by boat via, from the Shetland, from the Scottish mainland via then Orkney, probably the Outer Isles in Orkney, then Fair Isle, then Shetland. On a good day, you can see that route from Orkney, Fair Isle, Shetland. You can actually see each of the coasts. Um, so you can navigate by sight. However, once you get down near the waves, um, if, you're if you are crewing a log boat, which is the presumed method of transport for these people, um, it's actually it strikes me that there's quite a level of sophisticated navigation going on because they can't literally, uh, when you're down near the waves, you can't navigate by sight like that. So these guys that arrived in Shetland are already seafarers. Um, they are bringing with them um, their knowledge and culture from elsewhere. And they they are, they appear to be hunter-gatherers still. We are, we, are, we are what would be within the Neolithic, probably, um, on mainland Scotland, but, but these guys arriving in Shetland, are, are, it's right on the transition. And they, they have left a shell midden by the coast that eroded, eroded out. This is by Sumber Airport, for those who, who know Shetland a little bit. Um, this mid shell midden is eroding out and was excavated and dated. Um, and I think, it, although it constitutes the earliest evidence, I would caution that I suspect with sea level rise, we've lost a lot of the early evidence. So this is the earliest evidence we have. Um, it probably isn't necessarily the first people. Uh, could I have the next slide, please, Mark? Cool. Um, this midden um, was full of shellfish, seals, seabirds, and cetacean bones. It looks like it may have been seasonal occupation. So whether these were people who were coming by boat to Shetland every summer, uh, perhaps coming as I say from Orkney and Fair Isle and actually were almost regular, sort of spending their summers here and then going south again, or whether they were staying elsewhere in Shetland and coming to West Bow during the summer, we don't know. Um, but they are living by the sea, from the sea. However, if I can have the next slide, please, Mark. This changes. 
with the spread of agriculture, you see across the whole of Europe, a uh, focus that's becoming more and more obvious with the isotopic analysis that's happening at the moment. There's more and more focus on arable. Um, they are, they've become farmers and they seem very determined to be farmers. Um, and even in Shetland, now some of this data is still, it's still new and, and has been off and on debated, um, but the data seems to suggest that even in Shetland, they are living with a largely terrestrial diet um, in, the, in the early Neolithic, just like they are everywhere else in Europe. It was a hard life for these guys. These, um, the burials at Sumbra, these, this was a kist burial that was excavated in the 70s when Sumbra Airport was being built. So this is in a very similar area to West Vaux, but um, slightly later. Um, there was a mixed group of a minimum number of individuals of 18 and mixed family, uh, mixed presumed family grouping of adults and children. Uh, the children, interestingly enough, have a high marine based diet, but show indicators of starvation. And so there's been a there's been an argument that the children were put onto a high marine diet out of desperation when they were struggling. Um, the adults don't gen are generally still living on on the proceeds of their arable agriculture um, at this time. So it was a hard life for some of these early settlers, and I suspect a very hard life if you're trying to make your way by arable agriculture on Shetland rather than relying on the sea, as you'll see right through the rest of this presentation. Could I have the next slide, please, Mark? Oh. As we move through the Neolithic and Bronze Age, you can see the contact continues. These aren't people that travel to Shetland and then become cut off. This, the contact continues, the culture spreads, architecture changes in Shetland, it changes in Orkney, it changes in mainland Scotland, within roughly the same, same time scale. Shetland is slightly on the edge, it's a bit ephemeral, the architecture is, the arable agriculture is less good, the land less rich, so you're not seeing what you get in Orkney with the big monuments, but what you are seeing is continuity. You're seeing houses on Shetland that look like the houses at Scarra Bray. Um, unfortunately, not quite the same level of preservation, but some nicely preserved sites. Um, and this carries on. Could I have the next slide, please, Mark? And to put up a site that's very familiar to Joe, um, I couldn't resist not putting up Chanawick, um, which we exhibited in 2015 um, with Scape. And um, but just to illustrate the brocks, um, Channelwick Brock Well uh, could be overlaid on other Brock Wells. The, the, the plan of these places is exactly the same as you would get in Caithness, elsewhere in mainland Scotland. Um, these cultures are moving around, they're trading, they have constant contact throughout the prehistoric period with mainland Scotland, but it's all Scottish facing. Um, all of this culture is exact, is typical of mainland Scotland. Uh, we're not seeing anything from Norway or Scandinavia or anywhere, all, all mainland Scottish at the moment, um, into the Iron Age. Uh, could I have the next slide, please, Mark? Then this carries on through the late Iron Age, and then you start to get arrivals by the sea who make significant changes. These people aren't bringing aren't just keeping up with the culture elsewhere, um, but they are, I should say, but it's a rapidly changing culture elsewhere and they're bringing these changes with them. And they're the most rapid changes that Shetland sees. So we get Pictish culture coming in, whether this is Picts moving, obviously this is the great mystery with Picts. So we, we don't know whether these are a group of people moving or culture spreading, but we start to get the first depiction of sea travel going on. Um, so the Papal Stone, which is 8th century, uh, found in the graveyard at Papal on uh, Borough Island, Shetland, um, appears to depict um, people crossing the sea. Probably, it's been suggested, uh, monastery uh, monks and missionaries crossing the sea um, as part of the Celtic conversion um, during this period. Um, and we certainly, we get things like the St. Indian's Isle Chapel, 
um, whose name suggests um, the, that early Celtic Christianity. We get loads of Papa and Papal names appearing, which would suggest um, the early monasteries being spread by Pictish Christianity. Um, so this appears to be a depiction of people crossing the sea. Um, there's lovely, lovely images of them with their with their cloaks on and there looks like a Shetland pony there um, that the guy's riding um, and they're coming to spread the word and certainly Shetland does appear to become Christian at this point again in line with with mainland Scotland and to go to the absolutely classic seaborne arrivals um, there's graffiti on a sa on sandstone at Yarlsoff, and there's also another on a piece of shale, um, which depicts. These have always been called Scandinavian or Viking boats. There's a little bit of debate about because we don't know what boats the Picts had. We could, of course, be looking at Pictish boats. The dates are not definitive one way or the other. We could be looking at early early Norse coming in, or we and being depicted here, or we could be looking at um at indigenous um pictish boats so as as this changes as you start to see see the changes happening you suddenly start to see a change um in the way of life that starts to look with the arrival of the vikings it suddenly shetland looks west and it doesn't really look back to mainland scotland particularly again for a few hundred years. Um, could I have the next slide, please, Mark? There's a lot of, right through these time periods, there's been a lot of import and export, but the most definitive happens during the early Norse period. Um, Shetland is importing steatite bake plates from Norway. That's perhaps to be expected. The early Norse are coming in, it tends to be the Norwegians that are arriving north in Shetland, um, rather than the Swedes, so you would expect things like that to travel with them. Um, and Shetland continues to have its culture of making of what it looks akin to prehistoric pottery. It's sort of a continuity of pottery going on, where Norway's bit largely a ceramic by this period. Um, Shetland carries on with both pottery and steatite, that's soapstone, and but it does so well that they, they, with the steer type that's available on Shetland, that they actually very early start to export. So steer type vessels start going to Orkney from around 950. And by 1100, they're exporting to Faroe in the West Niles. Um, this, is, this is all spreading everywhere. The, the quarries on Shetland, there's, there's two famous ones. There's a few smaller ones, but there's Catburn steer type quarry on mainland Shetland. And there's a quarry on Fetla as well. Um, and they, th you can actually still visit them today and they look like the photograph. You can still see the rough outs um, lying at the quarry and broken vessels. Um, Steatite had been used in Shetland from the Neolithic onwards. Um, but when the early Norse arrived, they exploited it thoroughly. They saw the potential of what they had here and did a lot of work with Steatite. Um, they, made, they made lamps, they made fishing weights, everything, they made huge bowls, everything um, was suddenly made of, made of soapstone. Um, it's a very soft, easy work stone. And to a point, as I say, where it was heavily exported. The other thing, we know they were exporting from Orkney and we suspect they were exporting from Shetland too, was, um, was fish, probably exporting dried fish. This was beginning of the, the wonderful term, the fish event horizon where suddenly around 1100, everyone in, certainly in the North Isles and Scotland are, there's, there, or Northern Scotland, there is intensive deep sea fishing happening. Um, they are fishing places like um, the sound, the, some of the really fast flowing sounds um, between Shetland and Fairall that they've never been able to fish before um, because they can work with deep water fishing now. Um, so these are getting exported to all of the Viking towns. So if you imagine the demand that's coming in from, from Viking Dublin, Viking York, um, all these, and, and of course the Scandinavian towns, all these places are suddenly, there's demand for imports of steer type vessels and a huge amount of fish to support the towns. Um, so Shetland 
begins to look like the Shetland of the 19th century by the early Norse period. You, it's starting to make it, it's starting to be a fishing, a serious intensive fishing farming community. Um, and that's where its identity start, begins to get established with this recognizable boat use. And I'm gonna hand over to Mark now um, to take you through more about the development of the Shetland boat. Thank you, Esther, it's brilliant. Okay, so yeah, I'm just gonna minimize that, there we go. Whoops. Okay, so carrying on from where Esther left off really, I think we need to uh, realize that sea travel was widespread uh, from a very early period. And as Esther said, you know, there were probably two types of boats that were originally used. They were um, dugouts, uh, which later became expanded log boats, uh, which I'll talk a bit about in a minute, and also hide boats. Um, into, as Esther said, <clears throat> you know, we don't know uh, the type of boats that people came from Scotland um, to Orkney and then Shetland. Um, we, we just don't have any evidence for that uh, at the moment. Um, I'd like to begin my part of the presentation um, with this boat, the Halsnoy boat, uh, which was um, found, which has been dated to around about 100, 300 CE. Um, the boat was found in a bog that was being drained in 1896. There wasn't a huge amount of the boat left, unfortunately. Uh, what remains of the boat is on exhibition at, in the Bergen Museum. Um, the interesting things about this boat, which you can probably see, are the way the frames are connected to the sides of the boat and the keel. And you'll notice that there's some raised um, bits of wood which are lashed together. Um, if I move the cursor, you probably see uh, these. And these, these wooden pieces are called cleats. And they would have been hewn, uh, as the plank was hewn down to the correct thickness, the cleats were left. So the height of the cleat is probably the original thickness of the timber before it's um, trimmed down to a plank. Uh, these cleats are lashed to the frames, uh, which in Shetland we call bands. Uh, and in Norwegian, they're called beta. Uh, and the, th the, the rope that was used to lash the bands or the frames to the, the, the planks uh, was probably something like lime bast, um, which uh, basically is the other fibres between the, the bark uh, and the tree. Um, and you can see between the, the planks that they actually um, have caulking between them, which was originally moss. And you can also see that the boat is laced together. It's not actually riveted. Um, they're not using iron fastenings or wooden fastenings at that time, uh, the boats were actually laced together. They're, they're quite often called stitched, but stitching is a bit of anathema really. It, it, really the boats were laced together. And it's quite interesting that they still do this in um, Southern India today. I've, I've seen in Southern India, um, boats being built in a, similar, in a similar fashion. So moving on, so now we move on a few hundred years. Well, the Nydam ship, it's probably around about the same period, really. And you can see in the photograph of the drawing, or it's the drawing, really, um, the frames. And you, again, you can see the cleats uh, where the frames are lashed to. However, this boat, the Nydam ship, was actually iron fastened. So that's a departure from uh, the smaller lace boats. Um, and then we've also got the Sutton Who ship, which again, there's another departure there. Again, you know, we always think of clinker boat building as being Anglo-Saxon, uh, sorry, as being Viking. And of course the Sutton Who ship was Anglo-Saxon, it wasn't Viking. Um, and as Esther was talking about the Pictish boats, uh, we probably think that they were clinker built as well. So the Vikings didn't invent clinker boat building. That was around uh, prior 
prior to the Viking age, as we've just seen with the Hausnoi boat. Um, and we have to remember that the Romans were around as well. Uh, their boats generally, I think, were carvel built, that's plank on frame, rather than a shell construction, which clinker boat building is. Um, so it's slightly different, but the, certainly there would have been an influence from uh, the Roman period. And moving down, we've got the Usaberg ship. Uh, the Usaberg ship, uh, as you might know, was a, a famous ship. Um, it's a royal burial with two female um, people found, two, two, the remains of two women were found within the burial. Um, uh, this ship, the Usberg ship, was 21.5 meters long. Um, and so I forgot to say with the Nydam ship, that was a rowing boat, not a sailing boat. Sutton, who is a bit open to debate, um, about rowing and sailing. The Usaberg ship, there were signs of uh, a mast uh, and, and a mast step within the vessel. However, trials of the, they've built several replicas of the Usaberg ship and none of them have been particularly successful at sailing. Um, so the, the thought at the moment is that that was more of a, a rowing boat than a sailing boat. <clears throat> Whereas there's the ship here, the Gokstash ship, which is a ninth century vessel, as was the Usaberg ship, was definitely a sailing ship, um, sailing and then rowing. So this gives us some kind of background to where we're going um, with boat use in Shetland. And significantly, this brings us to small boats again, like the Hausnoy boat. The Hausnoy boat was a four-oared boat. Um, five to 5.5 meters long, that's 17 to 18 feet long. And within the Gokstash ship burial were found um, three boats. One boat was smashed beyond repair or restoration. However, there was a six oared boat, which is in the top right hand picture of, um, of the screen. And then in the left hand side of the screen is a four oared boat. Now in Norwegian, six oared boats are called sexering and a four oared boat is called a faring. You can see that boats have changed quite considerably since the Hausnoy boat. They're now iron fastened. Um, the bands are much more, the frames are much more slender. And these bands are now fastened to the strakes with fastenings, they're not lashed. Um, and the fastenings to the keel, they're, they're actually fastened using wooden tree nails. Um, so the bands or the frames are fastened using tree nails and the planks are fastened using iron fastenings. Now these boats, we, when uh, the Norse arrived in Shetland um, in the ninth century, they would have brought boats with them because once in Shetland, you would have needed a boat to get around. And I think, you know, um, our view today is very much of the sea as a barrier to, to life, whereas previously the sea was seen as the highway, the road on which pretty much everybody traveled, um, particularly in places like Shetland and also in places like Western Norway. Uh, Western Norway, as I'm sure you know, is, um, has lots of fields and those field systems stretch miles inland and so it's much quicker, it was much quicker to go by boat than it would be to try and walk or go by horse around, around a field. In Shetland, the first proper evidence we get of boats really, um, there's some finds at Jarlshof, which Esther talked about earlier on. Um, there were some drawings, but also some boat nails found at Jarlshof. Um, but recently in 2002, time team from Channel 4 um, carried out an excavation uh, with Colleen Beatty and Magna Dalland on Fetler at a place called the Giant's Grave at a place called Aeth in Fetler. And this, this burial um, actually was a folklore. Um, it, it was um, always regarded as a burial. The mound was regarded as a, as a burial of a, a Norse seafarer who had drowned um, and some boat nails and rivets had been recovered um, 
years before. And I think these um, fastenings are actually in the National Museum of Scotland. Um, so anyway, time, time, team, time team came along and excavated the, the mound and they found um, the outline of a boat. Now, um, the boat was um, 7.15 to 8 metres long with a beam of 2.5 to 2.6 metres wide. <clears throat> now, this is roughly the size of a sex ring, a six oared boat. It, it is too big to be a four oared boat. And they also found, as long, along uh, with uh, boat fastenings, they also found um, bits of where the keel joined the stem, uh, just along that area there, which um, was very uh, corroded and they uh, took it to Lowick Hospital and had it x-rayed. And this is the x-ray here and you can see the, the boat nails uh, within the remains of the, the timber structure. Um, there's no body found within the, the boat burial, uh, just one oval brooch. And so the burial has been attributed as being a female burial, although there's no other items there. So, it's, you know, it's, you can't, can't definitely say it was a female that was buried there. But at the moment, the evidence is pointing in that direction. So, as I'm sure you're aware, um, Shetland doesn't have much in the way of trees, certainly not for boat building or for boat repair. And so timber would have had to come from Norway. And this timber trade um, is thought to have begun when the Norse arrived. The Norse would have traveled here in boats. Um, they would have brought small boats with them. And they would, as I said earlier on, they'd be traveling around by boat all the time. And as Esther correctly said, you know, fishing from quite early on became quite an important um, part of Shetland um, commerce. So it wasn't just Shetland that needed wood um, for boat building and for building houses and things. Um, Pharaoh also did, as did Iceland. So there's a, a well-known timber trade that began quite early. In fact, uh, just north of Bergen, there's a field and that field is called Yelta Fjorden. Now, uh, Yeltland is the Old Norse term for Shetland. So for a field to be called Yelta Fjorden, um, means that trade had begun very early on with Shetland. Uh, the main wood exporting area, certainly by the 17th century, was Bienna Fierden, um, with Samnanga in the north, moving south was Fusa, then on the west coast was Us, the principality of Us, and going further south was Strandvik. And then further south still was a principality called Tuznes. Um, the way the timber trade operated, certainly um, during the 17th century, so we've moved on a bit now, unfortunately, um, which is when records begin uh, for, tim for the timber trade, was that um, Shetland merchants and landowners were going across from Shetland to Norway to collect timber in small ships. Um, the ships were open, uh, possibly similar to the one on the left-hand side. Uh, the drawing of the ship here is of Skudelev III, which is found in Roskilde Field um, in the 1980s. Now, this is a, an 11th century ship, and certainly ships would be slightly different by the um, 17th century, but not hugely so not for your average landowning person. There were some very, there were larger ships in Shetland. Um, there were some very wealthy people in Shetland which had the resources to own big vessels, but the majority of people uh, would have only been able to um, finance a small vessel like this, which would have been about 40 to 50 feet long and would have carried a cargo of roughly about four tons. So they go to Norway, bring back timber, and bring back boats. And the boats um, would have been brought back in board form, that is, unset up. Um, quite often people refer to these as kit boats, and that's a bit of a, an IKEA um, thing, really. Um, I think we need to forget the idea of a kit boat. 
uh, building a boat from um, timber that's been rough cut is a huge skill in itself. Um, so the people that were building these boats were boat builders. Um, I think we can, we can do away with the term kits really. Um, the boat trade with Shetland, I'll move on to the next slide if I can. Oops. Sorry about that. Shall I go back in a minute? I'll carry on with this. Um, the timber trade um, continued from the Norse period all the way through until the mid 19th century. Uh, and the trade in the mid 19th century began to die out um, for several reasons. Uh, the main reason was that boats were being constructed in Shetland to a different model. So the boats that were originally being imported to Shetland from Western Norway were uh, a typical uh, four oared or six oared boat. And there are some records of eight oared boats as well. Um, I'll move on a bit actually. So in fact, I'm gonna skip forward a bit to show you what the boat was like. So this is uh, an Usavar boat, which is from, um, Björn of um, It was created in the principality or built in the principality of Us, hence the beginning of the, the name of the boat, Uselva. Um, these were four and six oared boats, uh, and there were some larger eight oared boats as well. So the boat you're looking at here, which um, I took this photo in 2014 in Tuzness, in the Tuz at Tuzness Fest, um, would have been the typical boat that was brought to Shetland up until um, the early 19th century. Now, I don't know if you can see, but there's um, along the, the plank, there is, looks like a, a bead or a molded pattern. I'm gonna go back now to this because this pattern is quite important. Um, in the top left-hand photograph, picture there's uh, a detail from the Gokstaff firing so that's the ninth century four oared boat and I don't know if you can see there's like a beaded mold um, on the stem there and that's all that was on every plank on that boat and then if you go to um, the church boat the detail on the Hardanger church boat which is circa 1880 you can see a similar bead and then if you go to um, the Shetland Foreen, which is on the top right hand picture, you can see a similar bead. And then if you go to the bottom picture, um, which is of an Osava being built by Stig Henneman at the Osava Wagstaden in Us uh, in 2015, you can see the bead again. So the bead, the original bead, uh, which is circa 8900 on the Gokstaf Faring, is slightly different to the other beads, but only slightly different. So that bead has been continuous all the way through. It's still used in Western Norway today, and until recent years was used on Shetland built boats as well. I just thought I'd share that as a, as a definite ethnological detail of a continued uh, boat building tradition. Now in Shetland, this molded bead is called the snick. And the tool that makes the snick is called the snick hervel. Um, hervel in Norwegian means plain. Um, it's a, a word used in Shetland. Uh, so yeah, that's the snick hervel. And these two planes, one belonged to Jack Sheehan, who's a very famous Shetland boat builder. And the other belonged to Johnny Bruce, um, who's a, another very well-known Shetland boat builder. Skip past that. We've talked a bit about how boats were imported. Um, what we haven't talked about yet um, is when boat building began in Shetland. Now, this is interesting because the evidence for Shetland boat building begins really in the late 18th century, around about 1780. And we know this because um, in the records, people start to talk about boats being ordered with specific um, properties. And the main property 
was that they were requesting boats to be built with a slightly deeper keel. In Norwegian, it's called a Schilrenna. In, in, in Shetland uh, and, the, uh, and um, UK in general, we'd just call it a double garboard. So it's a slightly deeper keel, which makes sailing more easy, um, particularly sailing to windward. And this indicates that the boats are starting to go further offshore. We have records of being of boats being set up that's built um, in the 1780s from boards, as I said earlier on. And to build a boat from boards basically took two weeks, one person to build a boat in two weeks. Um, the, so to build the boat, you'd need to set the keel up and the stems. You'd need to make sure that they were completely um, in line with one another, because if they weren't, you'd build twist into the boat. Um, and if you built twist into the boat, the boat would row terribly and would sail terribly as well. Um, I'm losing my thread there. Yeah, so, so boats were set up, uh, took two weeks. There's also records from the 18th century of boats actually um, being built from deals. And these boats were called deal boats. So a deal is a, is another name for a plank of wood basically and they came in specific dimensions um, so these these um, boats were being built so as well as records of boats being set up there were boats being built um, and there's also records of boats being altered by being um, having an extra strake added to them so not only were the keels becoming slightly deeper but the boats were becoming slightly higher as well uh, which was obviously advantageous for, for sailing. We know that the boats during this period were going roughly about no more than 30 miles offshore on a really good fair weather day. Um, there, there's myth around boats um, going as far as 50, even 80 miles offshore. That just didn't happen. Um, that, that just would be ridiculous. So, uh, the photo you can see here um, is of a replica of um, Scooter Lev 3. So just to give you an idea of the, the type of boats that were trading between Norway and Shetland. Um, Shetland is pretty much due west from Bergen. So once you're out of the field system, uh, it is a fairly short hop across the North Sea to get to Shetland. Um, which is about uh, 200 nautical miles. So, you, you know, with fair wind, you could do it within two to three days, really. I forgot to mention when the trade, oh yeah, I did mention when the trade ended, that's okay. Um, I thought I'd show you some drawings I've made of some um, local boats um, to give you an idea of what they look like uh, and the boat types that existed in Shetland. Um, the famous one is the Ness Yol um, and the Fair Isle Yol, uh, but there's also a smaller version of Yol called the Harve or Piri Yol. And this is one that was built by George Jonsson around about 1890 in Dunrosnes. Um, and as you can see, um, compared to its length, it's quite narrow. Uh, and these boats are, are very fast to row. Uh, I've never actually sailed one actually. Um, but apparently they're quite tricky to sail. Um, you need a bit of, um, be a bit slightly careful because I think because of the, the beam to the length of the boat. Then of course there's the Foreen and the Foreen is, is the standard boat in Shetland. Um, pretty much everybody would have owned or had access to a four oared boat and you would have used this boat as we'll talk about in a minute for pretty much everything. Um, and this one is uh, of a boat called Anne, which is built by Lawrence Goodlard in 1899 and is 17.8 feet over the stem with a five foot, five inch beam, which is a fairly standard size. So that would have been about sort of, I don't know, 10 foot of keel probably. So as I said, the foreen was ubiquitous in Shetland. Um, the top left hand picture is taken from um, picturesque life in Shetland um, and it's called the market boat. Um, and as you can see, people were using the boats to go to market. So this is a, 
a group of women taking produce and livestock from the island of Bressa, which is near Lerwick, um, to a market in Lerwick. By the top right hand side, there's um, people launching the Papstone mail boat, Maggie. Uh, that picture was taken around about 1930. And in the bottom left hand picture, um, there's people out for a row. And then in the bottom right hand picture, uh, quite apt for this time of year and the weather we've been having recently, um, are a group of people digging out their boats, um, which are in their noosts. A noost is a type of um, boathouse, really, uh, unroofed boat garage, really. And they were digging their boats out to go across to the shop. Um, so basically, people used the boat for pretty much everything, from moving livestock um, to going to cut and bring back peats, um, to go to market, to go visit family and friends. Um, I live on Borough, and as Esther said, there's a there's a kirk in Papel, which is just down the road from me. Uh, and the minister used to go um, quite frequently from Quarth by boat um, to Papel. And people um, also went to be married and christened and also buried by boat. Get the slide to move. So we've looked at some four oared boats and now we're moving on to six oared boats. As I said before, probably the iconic, one of the iconic boat types in Shetland is the Ness Yarl, which is in the top left hand photograph. The most iconic boat type, top right, is the Six Serene. Um, both the Yole and the Six Serene were uh, deep water fishing boats. Uh, the Ness Yole famously uh, was used for catching saith, which as Esther mentioned, uh, began in the Norse period really. Um, and round the bottom of Shetland, off Sumbra, between Sumbra and Feral, there's a tidal race called the Sumbra Roost. Um, or, and then moving north um, to Mockleflogger, there's another tidal right race around the top of Unst. There's also a tidal race that runs between Unst and Yell. And in those tidal races, Saith tend to like to feed. And so um, these boats, the, the yoles were used um, to catch these fish because of their slender beam um, compared to their length, they were ideal for, for rowing or sailing um, just outside the tidal race um, with the lines inside the tidal race, the hand lines to catch Saith. The Six Serene uh, was a much bigger boat. So the yoel was um, around about 23 feet long with a 15 foot keel. Um, and the Six Serene um, in the 18th century is around about 18 feet long. It was an average size. And then by the latter 19th century, they were um, the largest were 30 feet long. Uh, the Six Serene industry, which you can see in the top right hand picture, is 20 foot of keel and 30 foot over the stems. Uh, a replica of that boat has been built called Vela May. Uh, and we sell Vela May regularly um, <laughs> prior to COVID um, in Shetland. And we also take members of the public out in her. Uh, uh, the Six Serenes, as I said, we wouldn't go any further than 30 miles offshore. And they'd have to be absolutely certain the weather was good before they went. Um, I can't imagine what it was like to go sailing and not knowing uh, what the weather's going to be like when you got to the fishing grounds and what it was going to be like on the way back. And of course, there were some tragic storms. 1832 was a, was a, a classic um, where many Shetland fishermen died and boats were lost. Um, the fishing was ex prosecuted from uh, six marines using long lines. And some of these long lines could be up to seven miles long uh, with hooks spaced about three feet or a meter apart. Uh, and the base on these lines was generally um, piltex or a young saith or haddock. Uh, and the lines were baited um, as the hooks were going over the side. 
and it would probably take several hours to actually set the lines. <clears throat> so the fishermen would set the lines, uh, then have something to eat and a bit of a, a break and then start hauling the lines again. Um, and depending on what they caught, they might have to set the lines again. And there are records of, of boats being um, 24 hours at sea. And the bottom picture is of a haddock boat, which basically is a smaller version of a six ream. Uh, and as the name suggests, uh, the boat was used to catch haddock. Uh, um, uh, a lot of haddock boats were round about 13 foot of keel, which made them round about 20 feet long over the stems. The boat rigged uh, for sailing at the bottom there is rigged with a standing lug. Um, Originally, they were rigged as per the six serene, originally as a square sail, and then with an asymmetric um, asymmetric square sail. Uh, but as you can see, they also use standing lug with jib. So that was the, the main fishing boats, really. Um, and then around about 1880, as people began to become more wealthy, um, and life became slightly easier, recreational sailing began. And originally this was um, for the wealthy elite of Shetland, but very quickly it became a popular pastime for everyone in Shetland because everybody had boats. Um, regattas became incredibly popular towards the end of the late, 18th, uh, late 19th century, all the way through to the 1970s. Uh, when it sadly things changed. Um, roads in Shetland didn't appear until the 1840s. And I really like this photograph on the left hand side uh, and kind of sums things up how, how life was changing in Shetland that the person is transporting their boat lashed to the back of a Model T Ford um, in 1938. And that's quite a big boat. So it, it's just a sign of the times where people are starting to look upon a road transport more favorably than going by water. The photograph on the right hand side is quite an important photograph actually, because the boat you can see at the front, uh, probably one of the smallest boats in the photograph actually, is a green boat with a, a pinkish red sail, is a maid class boat and the maids became really popular um, from the late 50s all the way through to the 70s and as you'll see they're still being raced now but they look very different compared to the this first boat um, in this photograph. The boat was built uh, by Duncan Sanderson um, who was from Unst and his family owned a boat building firm Sanderson's and Sons in Unst. Uh, Duncan later went on and founded the Unst Boathaven Museum uh, and collected a, an amazing collection of boats. Sadly, Duncan died last year. Um, he was approaching 100, so he had a really interesting uh, and good life. Um, so yeah, so Duncan um, invented the maid class uh, and these other boats in the photograph are ballasted boats, as is Maneva in the on the back of the Model T Ford. So they had lead ballast. Um, as you can see, they had a crew of three, the ballasted boats. And one of the crew, uh, sole purpose was to balance the boat and to shift ballast. So they would shift on every tack, they would shift lead ballast from one side of the boat to the other. So you had to be pretty strong to be able to do that. Now, moving on, we come to a photograph I took from Vela May actually, uh, back in 2016, I think it was. And this is a modern day maid. So you can see how the maids have developed over the years. Um, the thing that really changed was the development of epoxy glues and plywood. So during the 1960s and 70s, people started building maid boats out of ply using epoxy um, to glue them together. Uh, the rules Keep cha kept changing as well within the maid class. <clears throat> the maid class, for those of you that don't know much about sailing, in sailing, when you're racing, there's various classes of boat. 
Some are strict one designs, which means you can't change them at all. Others are more flexible and you can change certain aspects of the boat. And then you get things like the maid class, which are called development class. So basically the rules are fairly lax. You probably have a maximum length, maximum breadth and maximum depth and a maximum sail area. And apart from that, you can pretty much do anything. So boats are being built I call it checkbook sailing really, because people were building a new boat every couple of years. Um, and this kind of made it untenable for most people. And so people began to lose interest. So right up until the early 1980s, sailing was really, really popular in Shetland. Summer regattas were huge events. Um, there would be dances, parties, um, everybody basically would go. And there'd be land sports as well as activities on the water as well as sailing there'll be rowing races and um, bathtub races all sorts of things going on swimming races now so there's a few of us um, as you can imagine traditional Shetland boats aren't particularly popular in Shetland anymore um, some of them have been decked over and have um, what I'd rather term as ugly wheelhouses and inboard engines. Um, and others, you can still see some boats lying around rotting. Um, this is my boat, which I acquired via a friend of mine. Um, this boat uh, is called Girl Christie. She was built by um, Davy Bruce on the island of Walsa, at a place called Score in 1949 for a chap who lived on Yell. Um, and the boat was used, it's a four odd, it's a four reen, uh, was basically the family's boat. They used it for subsistence and a bit of commercial fishing. They used it to shoot seals uh, and they used to fish for halibut. Uh, and they also used to race it and it was very successful at the regattas. Uh, and then um, the final photograph here is of um, Vela May. Um, being sailed at um, Shetland Boat Week. Okay, so that's me done really. I'll pass back to you Esther if that's okay. Thanks Mark. Yep, that's great. Um, I am gonna just, if you could just go to the next slide please Mark. Yeah. I am just gonna finish us up with a quick wrap up of where all this leaves us with archaeology. Um, so all these years, a lot of the things we're focused on in Murder Die are trying to record, and one of the big incentives for setting Murder Die up was, was we realised that the archaeology of these small boats particularly, and these small, and the, to a certain degree, the fishing industry, but largely the small boats, is um, quite overlooked. Um, a lot of it's post-medieval archaeology, um, a lot of it, it's very common, there's hundreds of boat nooses around Shetland, and they run the risk of being, oh, can we, yeah, got them. Um, they run the risk of being so common that no one ever records any of them and then we lose them. Um, they're also really interesting because we don't know when the news came to Shetland, but it was certainly here. It certainly was here. It was a Viking concept, a Norwegian concept. Whether it predates that, we've absolutely no idea where, where they kept their boats before that. But <clears throat> it's certainly at least early Norse. And this photo on the right is of a Norse noost. Um, this was has been OSL dated, so optically stimulated luminescence dated, um, to as possibly as early as the 13th century, the, no the noose being created and then converted into a saw pit during the 16th century. Um, this the only reason they had any indication this might be early is because this was near a known Norse site. And when the site was excavated, they also excavated out these, these faint traces of noose that they could see. So partly noose could be hiding all manner of things because these noose, when they were first seen, looked exactly the same as any 18th or 19th century noose. So we have no, no idea how old some of these noose are. Um, they also are, I, I have a particularly soft spot um, for a little bit of rather underappreciated archaeology for, of ordinary people. Um, and so these aren't monumental and they're often built within living memory or, or certainly close to. 
Um, and so they, they run the risk of being quite heavily overlooked. And as we were working with them, we started looking at the niche originally, but then we've increasingly kind of accidentally started picking up the fishing stations as well. Um, we didn't intend originally to start recording fishing stations, but we realized that these big fishing stations uh, for the half um, and, and the various other sort of deeper sea fishing were, are also lying, you can see a photo there of Stennis, um, they're just lying in, in, in a ruinous state unrecorded on the coast edge, so they're very subject to erosion. And they again are, they were massively busy hubs of activity in the 19th century um, and were are the industrial archaeology of Shetland, effectively, um, but are again going fairly unrecorded as part of this prosaic kind of archaeology of, of everyday life until recently. Uh, could I have the next slide, please, Mark? So you get sites um, like this um, one on the, the left where you've got a sort of stacked concrete slab um, built building um, and pier from a fishing station. Um, and these, this was reputedly one of the earliest concrete houses in Shetland. So all kinds of slightly, slightly um, obscure random post medieval archeology span going on here. Um, but again, um, it tells a story of an industrial Shetland that tends to get overlooked. Um, but the, and the small boats that Mark's been talking about that are very close to our heart and, and started this whole project um, are, are lying all over Shetland. And you can see these noosts, um, they can be neglected, they can be, they can have rotting boats in them like this foreign. Um, or they can, in some cases, be very actively used still and still being used for a small boat today because the noose is still a convenient way to hold a boat out of the wind and weather over the winter. Um, so it's a very much a sort of live, a, a struggle, very struggling living tradition um, that we're just catching the end of. Um, and this is the time when it's really important to record it because as I've sometimes used as a sort of parallel to people, um, if somebody caught the end of the brocks or the end of the stone circles, it would, be would have been absolutely amazing. And we're seeing the end of a tradition here. Um, but because just like the people who lived with the end of the brocks, because this is modern, um, it tends to get overlooked. And um, now is a great time to record it. And that's why M Mark and I have teamed up because Mark with his combination of boat building and um, sort of ethnography and history, um, we're collecting a combination of the archeology span and, and the archive um, material and the oral histories. While we still have such things to draw on, it's, it will be amazing if we could get a description of a Brock builder, where we can actually get a description of somebody using a noose. Um, and so we've been running a project um, during where we were originally supposed to be running the Borough Noose project, um, but in March that kind of died a death, <laughs> along with any funded projects that were in the pipeline at that point, um, with COVID, but, um, and may or may not revive. But that was supposed to be working with the community to record noose, and I'm sure we will get out again in some format to do that. Um, but so we had a quick switch to lockdown because the you know time and tide waits for no man um these things are still eroding regardless of whether we're locked down or not so we did a quick switch to a lockdown project uh, online and we've re sorry <laughs> lost my video for a second we have recorded over a hundred noosts and sets of noosts without actually setting foot outside our houses it's all been sent in by members of the community so they've sent in photos They've sent in rough dimensions, they've sent in grid references, and they've sent in stories. So we're collating together a picture of this, the end of this living tradition um, as it ran in Shetland. Um, and if you can have the last slide, please, Mark. Um, so if you're interested in these stories, you're interested in what we've been doing, um, do have a look, as Joe said, and don't worry, Joe, I will plug our website. Um, the, have a look at uh, our website, so it's uh, modadie.org, and on our social media, we're on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, so go give us a follow. Um, we have 
a monthly newsletter, we have regular blog posts, and we try to get all these stories out there. We've also got our first um, report out, um, open access on the on the website, um, so you can have a read about um, Shoreside and the, the Noost and Crofts and the story that we recorded there. Um, so just to, just to finish up, thank you for listening. Come and check us out, and um, we hope to see you virtually sometime.